Very good. Uh, at what point did you decide to get into public service and politics, and why? Well, my, my family has always been directly or indirectly um, involved in public service. I, even from my independence, one of the heroines of, of our independence was my great grand uncle, uh, uh, um, uh, great grand aunt. aunt. Uh, my grandfather, my great uncle was president of Colombia between 1938 and 1942. He became a very close ally of the U.S. in the war. My, and my family founded a newspaper 101 years ago. And so I sort of lived and was raised in this atmosphere of politics, public service, journalism. They were very much interrelated. I, after I graduated, I, I went uh, to, to work with the Coffee Federation. I was uh, a, a, an economist and I did a master's degree in uh, postgraduate work at the London School of Economics and I stayed living in London for for about eight years, and uh, I was drafted by my family to work in journalism. And uh, I had an experience which I want to share with you. Uh, after eight years uh, as deputy uh, publisher of the newspaper, and I was going to be the publisher, I went to have an exam uh, made, and uh, they diagnosed incorrectly that I might had cancer and uh, I I was shocked and I started sort of thinking uh, and uh, there was an advice that my grandfather used to give me says you must you must uh, uh, it doesn't matter if you if you're sorry for the things you did but don't feel sorry for the things you could have done and you did not do and I remember saying, I didn't really like journalism. I liked to be uh, in the action with politics. And at that time, by pure coincidence, I was offered the job of, after the doctor said, I'm sorry, it was a mistake, don't, uh, don't worry. Uh, I was offered a, a job as Minister of Trade, which was a new, uh, new ministry because uh, at that time, Colombia had a very closed economy. They decided to open, and it was a big responsibility. So I said, uh, this is really what I like. And so I jumped into public service, and I've been in public service since then. That was back in 1990. Well, you've also served, uh, in addition to being Minister of Foreign Trade, as Minister of uh, Finance and Minister of Defense. Talk a little bit about how those three roles work in Colombia. Well, I... I, by coincidence, uh, had to, to do very particular jobs, very uh, special jobs. As Minister of Trade, I had to open the economy. This is something completely new. I started negotiating free trade agreements, but I needed to, to build the institutions that would back our new uh, foreign trade policy. And so I built a, uh, created a bank, a foreign trade bank and an institution to promote exports and uh, all the competitiveness, uh, uh, how to promote uh, uh, the competition and what, what, that, uh, what, that, what that implied. As Minister of Finance, uh, I, that was another very uh, interesting experience. My country is going through a Tremendous crisis, probably the worst crisis in the, in the last hundred years. Economic and political crisis. Uh, there was a governability crisis. Uh, the president did not have the majority in Congress. Um, and uh, we had to take some very tough reforms. And uh, he sent part of his cabinet to, to ask me if I would join the government. I came from a, another party, uh, different from the president at that time. And uh, I said, uh, 
in, in what capacity? What, what do you want me to do? I said, whatever you, whatever you want. And I said, my God. Uh, and so I went to some friends, say, look, look what happened. This is an opportunity. And um, they said, you're a, you're a risk taker. High risk, high return. Which is the worst, the most difficult situation right now? I said, well, the economic situation, the financial situation. So choose that. And so I chose to become finance minister. Everybody thought I was suicidal. Uh, because we had, to, we had to take very tough decisions. They used to burn me, burn my picture in every single town in Colombia. And, and my kids were very small at that time and they asked me, Dad, I see you on television that burning, they're burning your picture. And I said to them, don't worry, uh, the smoke goes up to God and it's, a, it's an honor that they, they're giving me. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> anyway, uh, we took the we took very tough decisions. Uh, we managed to to get through Congress through some very very tough reforms. That today, in in today's financial situation worldwide, uh, we are one of the darlings of the uh, investors all around the world. Uh, our spreads are lower than most of of the countries in Europe, uh, and so we had a big success success there. But it was difficult at that time, but it's, it, it taught me how important it is to take tough decisions that, that are necessary and that afterwards you, were, you will um, benefit from, from the results. And as defense minister, I was appointed also in a very particular moment in our history. I served in the Navy. I was the first civilian defense minister to have served in the in the military in our history. That helped me helped me tremendously. Uh, starting starting uh, with the fact that I knew how to march, and that was very important. Um, and um, we are we have been going through almost 50 years of uh, internal war, internal conflict, with uh, some very tough guerrilla groups. Um, at that time, we, uh, we were having success, but we had not been able to, to really strike at them in, in where it hurt. And so what I did was a complete re-engineering of the way the military worked, especially from the intelligence. Uh, and what I did was exactly the contrary of what the United States did. Sorry to say, uh, it's getting the whole of the t intelligence community together, and st instead of competing one with the other, uh, sharing the information and creating synergies, and uh, that made a tremendous difference. And we started knocking them, uh, the, the leaders of the of these groups, uh, one after the other, and, and weakening them, and uh, we, we sort of change the whole strategy, the whole doctrine, security doctrine. And we have had uh, a, a tremendous success there uh, to the extent that today, as president, having been uh, signaled as the, uh, the I, wonder, I don't know what the word in English is, verdugo, the, the one that chops uh, people's head in, 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 in yes, executioner. Uh, executioner of the FARC. I now, today, I'm starting a peace, pro peace uh, program with them, a peace process to see if we can negotiate the termination of the conflict. So it's, it's um, <laughs> because, because when you fight a war, you fight a war for a purpose, uh, not for the sake of, of fighting. You fight a war with an objective. And since the beginning, I knew that the objective was to uh, try to consolidate peace in my country after 50 years. We've been killing each other for 50 years. And uh, I hope that uh, next time I come to KU, uh, I can say we achieved this very important objective in my country is to have peace. Okay. One of your policies that uh, I was very interested in, I thought folks would love to 
hear about it, is your effort to encourage more young Colombians to attend higher education or to be trained for jobs. Talk a little bit about what you're trying to do there. Well, education is something which is so fundamental to any country's development um, that uh, any, any sensible head of state will have to put education as one of the top priorities. Uh, and we've been trying to do that. Uh, with my wife, who's here with me, uh, we started a program uh, giving a lot of importance to education between the moment you're born and up to six years old. That's when the children learn how to learn. And uh, they sort of acquire the fundamental uh, capacities to learn. Um, in Colombia and all, most of the uh, developing countries, uh, that has been a, a neglected part of the education. And uh, we even brought a, one of the Nobel Prize winners from the University of Chicago who went there and said the most important development uh, investment you can make socially is to give more importance to the young infancy, what they call it. Then, uh, basic and primary, uh, uh, primary and basic education. Uh, this year, first of January of this year, I I signed a decree giving free education to every single Colombian that wants to go to primary and basic education. But we have a tremendous bottleneck after you graduate from high school. We don't have enough universities and enough technical um, um, programs, but also uh, people don't have the money to pay for universities, and m part of the universities are public and, and are free, but not all of them. So there's a tremendous challenge there, and what we've been trying to do is uh, to uh, give scholarships uh, around the country to the most needed uh, and uh, open up technical schools uh, all around the country, and uh, try to break that bottleneck. Because uh, in many countries, uh, that, that age between 18 and 24, 25, is the age if you don't have the students uh, or that young people, women, men or women, uh, studying or doing something productive, uh, that's when they become delinquents or drug addicts or whatever. And so we're doing a tremendous effort in, in, in that area. We have to, there's a long way to go, but we're making that a, a priority. Tell us a little bit about one of the first acts that uh, you won passage of uh, last year, the Victims and Land Restitution Act. What was the purpose behind that? Well, when I was fighting the, these guerrilla groups, um, Making war is, is much easier than making peace. Making war is even exhilarating, and you, you, you achieve uh, certain victories, and you feel very proud. Of course, it's part of the rules of the game. But since then, I said, we've been at war for so many years. Uh, we need to start thinking about peace. And, uh, but in order to achieve that peace, you must be, must be strong militarily. Again, as I said minutes ago, you make war to achieve peace. You don't make war for the sake of war. And since then, I said, we, I, I, I felt how deep the, 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 the wounds after 50 years of accumulating violence uh, we had in our society. So I said, when I became president, I said, we, start, we need to start healing those wounds if we really want peace. So I put in place, a, or I presented to Congress a very audacious piece of legislation that, uh, that uh, uh, allowed me to start repairing 
victim, victims of the conflict, uh, in the middle of the conflict, and start giving back to the peasants the land that was taken away from them by the violence. Uh, and uh, that's what we, we started. It was such an audacious piece of legislation that the Secretary, Secretary General of the UN went to Colombia. Uh, in the, in the signing of this piece of legislation. And it's part of the process of, of creating the environment for peace. If, you, if we are able to end the conflict by a, an agreement with these groups, this is a component. It's a necessary condition, a fundamental condition, but it's not enough. You need to, to build a much stronger environment through social policies through uh, fighting against poverty, through uh, policies that will decrease the tremendous inequalities that we have in our country. So it's a, a, a whole strategy that has many components. One of the fundamental components is this law uh, to repair the victims and to restitute land to the peasants. One of your objectives also, Mr. President, has been the Colombian infrastructure. What steps have you taken on that and how much success have you had? Well, infrastructure has been one of those, um, of those uh, areas where for many, many years uh, the presidents that uh, preceded me in, in this office, when they had to sacrifice something from their budgets they say, well, the least uh, uh, expensive in, in political terms is infrastructure. So we have been accumulating um, a, a situation of, of backwardness in terms of infrastructure. And uh, uh, if we want to be a, a sustainable uh, growing economy, we need good infrastructure. And, uh, and uh, I read, uh, I, I am very fond of biographies, and, uh, and uh, I've read many biographies of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his New Deal and what he did with the, uh, uh, the infrastructure in this country. Uh, not only did he win the war, but uh, he is in many places uh, remembered by the the investments in infrastructure that he made. Uh, and um, uh, we decided to, in the government, say, let's really make a big step here. The problem was our, f our financial situation. How, how do we pay for that, and, and how can we do that with a, a sensible fiscal situation for our public finances? So we started sort of being creative and we came came up with a with a, a a formula that will allow us and it's now in place it's working to increase the investment in infrastructure uh, using private uh, investors and foreign investors that will in, will allow us to go from 3 uh, to give you a, a sort of magnitude of, of of, of uh, numbers uh, to show you a difference. From between three, three and five billion pesos, we're going up to 40 billion pesos. So it's about 20 times more. And uh, there's a tremendous job there, the tremendous uh, opportunity there where we win and the investors win because uh, with today's economic situation around the world, uh, many of the engineering companies, big engineering companies are seeking work all around the world. And Colombia is one of the few economies that is growing very fast, and we need that in infrastructure. So, so the conditions sort of were put together, and we're doing a tremendous uh, effort in modernizing our infrastructure. Talk a little bit about uh, what kind of opportunities that Midwestern or United States companies have to do business in Colombia. Well, I, I met uh, the head and the top uh, executives of a company that is based here in Topeka. 
um, painless shoes. Uh, and uh, I said to them, well, um, great to have you, uh, to meet you. And they said, well, we already have uh, 32 uh, stores in Colombia, 32 stores. Uh, or, or even more, 50 stores, and I said, my God, and, and, and uh, what are you planning to do? Well, uh, we're going to open up 30 more. So that gives you an example of the opportunities. The, Colombia is a country that is growing. The last figure that we had was 4.9%, in, and last year we grew 5%. It's a young population. We're taking people out of poverty, so they're going to be uh, consumers of of all kinds of goods. Um, we have energy. We have biodiversity. We have water, which is a an increasingly scarce resource. Uh, we have a lot of land to increase the production of food in a world that is starting to have a food crisis. Um, we just became the third largest economy in Latin America. We we surpassed uh, Argentina in terms of uh, in economic uh, GMP terms and per capita uh, income. And uh, this is something which uh, shows you that the Colombia is, is a, uh, a rising star. And what we need is investment. The, the global competition today uh, is, is not as much as access to the markets is investment, because that's what, what creates jobs and what, what produces prosperity. And so uh, the Midwestern companies that have uh, had a success here in, in, in the US market or in the Midwestern market should explore, like we are exploring, many of our medium and small companies are coming to the United States. We now have a free trade agreement, United States and Colombia. And uh, seeing uh, Senator Dole, uh, he helped us a lot with this free trade agreement, and I appreciate that very much. This is a tremendous opportunity for both countries. It's a, a win-win situation. And uh, there are, Colombia is a, a very interesting market, 46, 47 million people. And, uh, uh, we need the investment, so there's tremendous opportunities uh, f with a, a much more closer relationship between the Midwest and Colombia, because there's not a, a lot of, of knowledge both ways. Colombia doesn't know very much what Kansas looks like, uh, and uh, the, Kansan, uh, the, the, the people from Kansas does, don't uh, know very much what Colombia looks like. But if we get to know each other better, I would... I, I, I tell you, because of a personal experience, uh, we would l like each other much much better and we can uh, create a lot of synergies together. How did you come, Mr. President, to make the decision to run for president? That's a very personal decision when you run for any elective office, the highest elective office in your nation. How did you make that decision? When did you make the decision and, and why did you want to do that? Sometimes I say, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a, a response that, that's not easy to, to, to make uh, with a sort of exact um, descriptions. It's, 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 it's a process. Uh, I was doubting very much since I entered public office it's natural that anybody who who goes into public service uh, wants to be president. And this is something like you get to the top. Uh, I had periods where I said I want to do it. Others where I said no, it's 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 not worth it, or or even sometimes doubting of, about your own ability. Um, but but. Uh, after the experience I had as a minister of the three areas where I was minister um, and uh, the opportunity presented itself when my predecessor wanted to run again for, for office but 
the constitutional court said no, you, you, you ran two, twice, third time is not possible. Uh, and I was sort of the ideal candidate and uh, things sort of the star, stars aligned and I said, well, uh, I want to do it. And uh, also because many times when you're a minister, uh, you have certain degree of, of freedom to do things that you want, but at the end it's, it's the president who takes the decisions. And uh, you're completely free to do whatever you think you should do uh, is only when you you have uh, nobody on top of you. And uh, I think what we have done in the last two years uh, proves that a lot of things that I wanted to do for a long time that I've been able to do or I'm trying to do. And, and I think this is extremely satisfying. Um, sometimes you, you make mistakes, sometimes uh, you fail. But uh, if the, at the end uh, the pluses are above the minuses, then you can go to your grave satisfied with what you did. Do you care, Mr. President, to make a re-election announcement here this afternoon <laughs> on campus? Oh, no, thank you, no. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of figured that's what you would say. We're going to open up to, uh, I have one last question, then we're going to open up to Q&A from uh, the audience, and we'll do about 20 minutes or so of that. So I know I've got uh, three members of my staff who have microphones. Hopefully they're making their way out so that we'll be ready to go. But Mr. President, my last question for you today is you had to make some real tough decisions, especially as Minister of Defense, uh, in regard to the internal conflict in your country. Do you think that having been very tough and having made those very tough decisions, then kind of makes you in a much stronger position to go and try to bring peace to your country? Yes, definitely. I will share with you one of the very tough decisions I had to make. When, when I started my government, uh, we started having messages with, with the enemy. Would you be interested in, in having a possible uh, conversation here and there? And the person who indirectly I communicated with was the number one, their leader. Uh, at the same time, I said, I would be interested, provided uh, you, we have two very clear conditions. First, completely confidential, until we both decide to make it public. And second, there's no contemplation whatsoever in the political uh, speeches or whatever, or how you refer to each other, or at least from, from us to, to them, in the judicial area and in the military. In other words, the war continues with no contemplations whatsoever. And he was my, in a way, interlocutor. And we, I had given orders to take all these people out, especially the high value targets. And I was confronted with a very difficult decision. We have, we have him surrounded. What do we do? And uh, I said, the rules are the rules. And uh, we must, if we want to be successful, we have to be very uh, clear on, on the rules of the game and persevere. And I had to take the decision to take him out, and we took him out. Those are the type of decisions that are extremely difficult, but I am certain that that is one of the reasons why we are sitting down in, in two weeks in Oslo, in Norway, to uh, talk about peace. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're ready for a Q&A from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Wait for one of the cordless mics. Please ask a brief question. No statements. 
Good morning, Mr. President. It's a pleasure that you are here. I'm Silvana Otero for Colombia, and I have a question for you. Please tell me a headline that you would write in El Tiempo to describe your relationship with Alvaro Uribe right now. Uh, you're a student from where? Uh, from, uh, from the w William Allen White School of Journalism? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say uh, it's it's a, a a good from from me from this side towards to my predecessor. There's no ill will. Um, I am a bit frustrated by him not understanding what we're trying to do. Okay. Next question. Okay, Susan. Hi, Mr. President. Uh, Norman Haas. I'm the importer of uh, premium Colombian chocolate, actually probably the largest importer of uh, premium Colombian chocolate in the United States, here in the Midwest, by the way. And I'm curious, as the ninth largest importer, I mean, a ninth largest uh, producer of cacao in the world, Colombia is, uh, do you see any opportunity to replace the coca that's been uh, sort of the scourge of the land there with cacao? Because as you give this land back to the farmers, isn't there some kind of program where you can help them grow uh, cacao, which is, I mean, it's world famous. It's a fantastic product. Let's get the, you know, the bad product out and let's get a, a wonderful product planted instead. Any plans for that? Uh, yes, and I, I would say this is a program that we're already starting. Uh, and uh, there's a tremendous potential to do that. Not only uh, cacao, but uh, many products that are needed in the, in the world markets today. As I, I mentioned, the world is starting to have a, a food crisis. Who's going to feed millions of Chinese and Indians and Indonesians that, that are, are going into the, are demanding more and more food? And we, Colombia is one of the eight countries in the world that has been um, signaled as countries with tremendous potential to increase the production of food. And you mentioned uh, how do, to replace uh, the coca uh, plantations that, that produce the cocaine that, uh, that uh, uh, poisons uh, the young people here in the United States and all around the world with cacao, which is a delicious chocolate that I, we had a, with the chancellor, delicious uh, dessert today made out of chocolate. <laughs> it's a big difference. And we, we, we won that. And one of the reasons, one of the points in the agenda with FARC that we introduced was precisely the issue of drug trafficking. They, if they decide to become a part of the institutional framework of the country uh, and become ally and not defenders of drug trafficking, uh, the U.S., Colombia, and the whole world is going to win a lot. And uh, if we have alternative production, cacao or other products, this is a win-win situation for everybody. We are already doing that in many areas in Colombia, and we plan and hope to do that in all the areas of Colombia, to continue er eradicating the production of coca, of the... the, the uh, primary product of cocaine, uh, we have been able to reduce that by more than 50% of what we had some years ago, and we need to reduce it to zero if possible. Right here. Mr. President, thank you for being here. One of the most fascinating things to me about your program for peace is not only your toughness, but the fact that you have agreed to allow the rebels, if they incorporate into the peace program to become part of a public government to be elected. Could you tell us a little bit about how that came about and, and what provided you the strength to permit a former enemy to rejoin the political process in your country? Well, first of all, we haven't taken that specific decision yet. This is part of what we're negotiating. It's part of what we call transitional justice. There are some 
some uh, very important uh, philosophical, moral, political decisions and uh, discussions in any society. Uh, things like where do you establish the limit between uh, the collective interest and the individual rights. Um, more recently, where do you establish the, the line between the role of the state and the role of the markets? In any conflict, in any process to, uh, to resolve a conflict, the most difficult decision is where do you put the limit between justice and peace. If you ask a victim that question, they will always answer, we want more justice, because he has been a victim. If you ask the same question to a future victim, they will always say, we want more peace. What does more peace mean is sacrifice, sacrificing uh, the punishment or the justice and being able to say, I forgive you. But that, that's where transitional justice com comes into, in, in, into the scenery. Uh, you need some principles. You need the victims to be repaired. You need the truth. Sometimes simply by knowing the truth it sort of liberates you from, from the hate that you, that you, that you feel. Uh, and uh, uh, also some kind of punishment. What kind of punishment? The transitional justice allows what they call alternative punishment. You don't have to go to jail. So those are the type of questions that have to be answered by a society that wants to uh, end the conflict and have peace. And this is exactly the discussions we're starting at this moment. Where do we where do we draw the line? Uh, I have not. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, when we take the final decision, there will be people on the both extremes that will be uh, not uh, satisfied. The people who want, who would like more justice says this is unacceptable, and people who want more peace would say this is unacceptable. But if the big majority of the country takes a decision, and I hope it will, and if we negotiate a, a good agreement, then that's the, the only solution that we have. Okay, we have a question in the back. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Uh, I believe at the uh, meeting earlier this year in Cartagena, uh, some Latin American leaders had expressed an interest in uh, uh, changes to uh, current U.S. policy and international policy toward illegal drugs. And uh, I just wondered if you could maybe characterize some of those sentiments and uh, speak to uh, what advantages those changes might have. Well, um, it was me <laughs> who, who uh, proposed that discussion. And I, I will tell you what, 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 I was, what I'm trying to achieve. Colombia has been probably the country that has paid the highest cost in this war on drugs out of any country in the world. Our best judges, our best politicians, our best policemen, our best journalists have been killed. Thousands of people and uh, the violence that has, this has generated, there's no other country that has suffered more. We have been relatively successful because we united at a certain moment and said we cannot be dominated by these drug cartels and uh, those big cartels that were very famous in the 80s and uh, in the 90s uh, have disappeared and the big famous drug lords are all killed or in jail. The last of the big ones, as a matter of fact, we caught him last week. <laughs> the last of the big ones. 
Um, and we have been able to reduce the, the amount, of, as I mentioned, of, of uh, land uh, uh, under cultivation of coca. And we have hit the, the whole chain of drug trafficking extremely hard. Uh, the number of, of, of tons of coke uh, that have been seized and uh, the assets. And, and uh, we have been, again, I say, relatively successful. At the same time, our success has meant the, that the problems around the region have increased. Central America is having a tremendous problem. Mexico is having a tremendous problem. You, you see consumption going up in, uh, in Europe. You see the West African countries now becoming more and more involved in drug trafficking. Consumption in the US, some people say it's going up, others say it's static, but the problem still is there. The amount, for example, of uh, people in jail here in the US simply uh, by the, the reason of being involved in some way with the drug trafficking is enormous. You have more, more people in jail, in the, in, in the American jails, than the whole population of prisoners of the whole of Europe. How much does that cost? So what I said is, and, and in Colombia, even, even that we've been successful, uh, we sometimes feel that we are like in a static bicycle. You pedal, you pedal, you pedal, but you don't advance. And so I said, is it, is it not time to start uh, seeing this with other eyes, analyzing if what we're doing is the correct thing? And if it's the correct thing, what is it that we're not doing correct because the problem is still there and it's growing? Or are there other better alternatives that for a society uh, would be less costly than what we are doing. Um, and let's open up the discussion without that uh, common prejudice where that this highly sensible political uh, uh, discussion uh, creates because you immediately and, and I've seen it in my country and I've seen it in, in, in other countries. This is an issue that polarizes society immediately. People go, oh, you're, you're, uh, you are proposing the legalization of drugs. No, how awful. No, nobody is proposing any legalization of drugs. Simply let's discuss the issues and see if we can find together, because no country by itself can win this war on drugs. We have to have a multilateral and international position. So that's what I, what I proposed to, to the 32 leaders that uh, were at this uh, summit in Colombia. Um, and uh, I must say that all of them said, this is a sensible thing to do. We, we uh, named or we established the, the OAS as, as the sort of the organization that will that will conduct this study to be a, an objective study, a scientific study, without the political ingredient. And then, if they have alternatives, let's discuss them. But not doing nothing, uh, uh, adopting the ostrich uh, attitude of this is a problem that we should not discuss because it's too sensible politically. It's not the way to correct uh, these type of problems. So that's what I proposed, and I'm going to say all the leaders, including President Obama, had the courage to say, we are interested in discussing it. That does not commit anybody to any solution, but uh, to at least open up the discussion, I think it's a very good step forward. Do we have a question right here? Yes. President Santos, this is John Hayes from the DU House in 1970. I would like to inquire uh, what your uh, medical facilities are. How are, I have MS. Are they 
currently doing any stem cell research in your country? In Medellin, I believe, is your um, medical research center. And I would like to know if that's anything is going on there at this time. Uh, I remember you were a very good basketball player. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I didn't I quite understand the, 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 uh, the question. Medical, huh? Medical research. Ah. Yeah. Stem cell research. Stem cell. Yes, sir. Uh, I have my brother-in-law. He's a doctor now. Uh, how do I answer that? <laughs> yeah, we're doing we we are doing research in Medellin on that, and and um, and uh, my my personal position, uh, my uh, regard to uh, that research, I'm open to it. Okay, we have a question in the back. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Alexander Stanley, a uh, current KU senior and uh, also a brother of the Delta Upsilon fraternity. Um, I was wondering if while you were in, in attendance at KU, uh, whether or not you hold any, held any leadership positions, uh, whether that be on campus or in your fraternity, and if so, how did that shape the leader you are today? Quite frankly, no. I, 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 <laughs> uh, I was not a, a leader. Uh, in, in, in any respect, uh, I was a common student, uh, struggling with my grades, um, trying to be a good student, trying to be a good uh, uh, fraternity member at the DU. Um, I was very disciplined. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very interesting time. I remember the Vietnam War was, was, uh, was on, uh, there was a passionate discussions about uh, all these issues and participating in those issues helped me a lot to see the different point of view, um, the, the dilemmas that for a, a student, uh, many of, of my, uh, my companions, uh, I remember the, the, the partner that I had at, at McCollum Hall, he, w he had to go to Vietnam um, and um, that was that was an experience that helped me a lot, but but no, the the, the answer to your question is no. I was I was not a, a special leader of any sort during my during my years here in KU. Okay, we have time for one last question. Do we have a question here? Juan, my name is uh, Joe Spies. Uh, we used to go to parties together through your friend Maru Angarita. Do you remember Maru? Uh, by the way, for those of you here, she is a uh, KU grad who um, was part of the first democratically elected uh, president in Venezuela. And we used to have lots of good political discussions back in the day. Uh, my uh, question for you involves energy policy in Colombia. My company is developing the most important energy technologies of the future. I've been in China uh, to promote and develop them there. And I'd like to have you just talk about energy policy and if renewable energy is part of that that you're uh, considering at this time. Uh, certainly. Um, Colombia is a very energy rich country. We have uh, lots of water and so we have a lot of hydraulic energy. Uh, almost 50% of what we produce is hydro uh, uh, produced energy. We have coal, very clean coal, second exporters in the world of coal. We have oil, and discovering more and more oil. Uh, but we are certainly uh, interested in developing alternative energy and uh, new, energy, new, new sources of energy. We apparently have one of the ideal situations for Iolic energy, the, the one that is produced by wind, there's, since Colombia is in the, in the top north of South America, the wind there is ideal for that. The problem has been that since we can produce such low cost energy with our hydro, that the technology still is too expensive to justify that type of, of, uh, 
of energy in Colombia. Uh, same, in a, in a, same thing happens with the solar energy. We have uh, sun uh, all year round. We could, we could develop solar energy, but still too expensive to compete with uh, our hydro. But of course, we need uh, to develop new energies. We're, st we're still, uh, we're starting with uh, cracking the, and, uh, but we, we have a big question mark of the effect of that in our environment and our water resources. We, 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 we don't know enough in order to see if we stimulate that or not. But uh, any other sources of energy are, are more than welcome, and you're more than welcome to go to Colombia and explore that. That's what we need. We need technology. We need investment. We need foreign uh, investors. We, we consider foreign investment as a necessary part of our development. We treat foreign investors as, as our partners. If we, they do well, we do well. And so you will find a friendly country to your investment in Colombia. Mr. President, thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. Are you guys with this party? Oh, okay. I'm asked, please everyone, stay in, stay in your seats until after the traveling party uh, departs today. We'll let you know when you can leave. Uh, but for the purpose of a very important presentation, it's my great honor to introduce Dean Danny Anderson. Danny, come on up. Thank you, Bill, for being here. Um, I have a microphone on my lapel, so I think everyone can hear me. Um, it is a real pleasure. No? They can't. You better use that one. Can you hear me now? It is a pleasure to be here to present you with the Alumni Distinguished Achievement Award from the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I am here with Tony Arnold. Um, he is the chair of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Advisory Board. Um, the Distinguished Achievement Award is the highest honor that the college bestows on any of its graduates. The award has been sitting here throughout the ceremony. Um, this is a Jayhawk based on a statue by Eldon Teft, um, the iconic Jayhawk that stands in front of Strong Hall uh, was sculpted by him, as well as the statue of Moses in front of our um, School of Religion. Um, and it is a pleasure to present this to you. And I'd like for you to remember three things about it. One, it is a symbol of the pride that we have in all that you have accomplished as a leader. Two, we hope that you are in Colombia. And finally, your favorite word is persevere. We wish you much perseverance in achieving your goals. Well, thank you very, very much. Really uh, a great honor for me to, to have received uh, this uh, uh, Jayhawk. Um, uh, next time, uh, next time that uh, President Obama is going to uh, go for North Carolina, I'll tell him <laughs> Jayhawks. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, this is for me extremely important, and and uh, be sure that uh, these three objectives that uh, you are. Uh, you are uh, telling me to to follow with with this award. Uh, they will be very much taken care of. And when we re reach peace, after persevering, uh, we will say thank you to the University of Kansas and thank you for your hospitality and your generosity, and thank you for all you have done for me. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Mr. President, it's been a real honor. Thank you for visiting the Dole Institute and coming back to the university. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming out. Please stay seated until we tell you you can leave except for the traveling party. Thank you. It kept cutting out. <laughs>